My name is Wangeshi Moshigadi. I'm born again. I love the Lord. In the first service, I asked my husband to stand and wave at the people. Now he's not here. And I've asked him to stand. <laughs> but I'm born again and I love the Lord. It's such an honor, honor to stand before you to bring God's word today. I do not take it for granted. I honor the father of the house, our bishop and Reverend Alice and all the ministers in this place. See, we are a church that is covered. We can celebrate them even in absentia with a clap. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. It's such an honor. Allow me to honor also the pastors here, the ministers of the gospel. You guys are amazing people. Such an honor. Right into our sharing for today. We have been looking at a series, and the series has been Christian Disciplines. Look at your neighbor, tell them Christian Disciplines. And we've looked at different disciplines, we've looked at Bible study, we've looked at confession. By the way, this is the series that we continue with even during our midweek service. Amen. And today we're going to put a block on that series. We're going to add on to it. We're looking at the heart of service as a Christian discipline. The heart of service as a Christian discipline. The heart of service as a Christian discipline. We have been saying and we continue to say that the aim of every Christian discipline is to make us look more like Jesus. The aim of every Christian discipline is to conform us into the image of Christ Jesus. So whether we pray or it's fasting or confession one to another or solitude and silence or biblical journaling that we are looking at this week on Wednesday, the aim is to make us look more like Jesus. I hope and I pray that you sat next to somebody that you like because you'll talk to them a lot. Look at your neighbor, tell them the aim of every Christian discipline is to conform us into the image of Jesus. And so the aim of the heart of service that we are looking at today, service as a Christian discipline, is to conform us into the image and likeness of God. And we have a few texts just to give you an outline of what we are going to be doing. We're going to look at a few texts. The second thing we're going to look at is what is service? What does it mean to serve? Who and why do we serve Barriers to true service. What are those hindrances that prevent us from serving God out of complete genuineness? We're going to look at the attitude of a servant. And then finally, we're going to look at the cross of serving. Amen? Now, our story is given of a young boy that was on a beach on the show. And there was an older man who was looking at the show. And there were starfish on the beach. Munajua starfish. Inaka kama? Very good. Class 100%. Sasa starfish ilikuwa imewaipiwa onto the show and the old man was walking and the young boy was taking the starfish and throwing them back to the sea. Because when the starfish is washed to the show, they will die because of the heat. They are not in water. They are not hydrated. They will die. And so the old man is walking and he looks at this boy taking a starfish Anarusha ndaniasi. Anachukua ingine anarusha. And he looked at this boy and, and wondered, Uyu, the starfish is full of a thousand and thousands of starfish. How long will he keep doing this? Ndiyo asaidia bitch. So he walks to the young boy and tells the boy, uh, you, uh, you look like a kind young man and you look like whatever you're doing is really good. However, it is futile because whatever it is that you're doing, how long must you keep doing this for the beach to be clear? And the boy just took another starfish and threw it back to the sea. And this is what the boy says. It might not matter to the entire beach, but it will matter to this one starfish. I want us to look at the heart of service. And I want us to look at Mark chapter 10. We're going to be reading from verse 32 to 45. If we have it in the NLT, that will be good. The Bible says, they were now on the way up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. 
Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Verse 33, listen, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem and where the son of man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. Verse 34, they will mock him and spit on him, flog him with a whip and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. Look at your neighbor, tell them, we want you to do us a favor. We continue. What is your request, he asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right hand and the other on your left hand. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the same baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Look at your neighbor, tell them among you, it will be different. We continue. Whoever wants to be a leader, other versions say uh, whoever wants to be great, among you, must be your servant. Look at your neighbor, tell them, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant. We continue. And whoever wants to be fast among you must be the slave of everyone else. 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Praise be to God. Amen. I want us to read Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 8. And this one, we're going to practice, our, or rather what Bishop JB likes to say, we're going to use our school fees and we're going to read. Amen. Do you remember when you were in primary school or in high school? I don't know if teachers did this to you. You would read passages... And you wondered why? You wondered to to me, Alini? Praise be to God. Today you shall use it. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 1 to 8. We can start to read. Therefore. Eh, 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 eh. Aya. Angalia neighbor mtapivi. Ambia get some energy. Get some psych. Aya. Let's read it together. Therefore. I oppose. We're learning about heart of service. One of the ways that we'll serve one another is if we wait for one another as we read. <laughs> Amen. Because part of service is unity. Hallelujah. So we shall go back to verse 5 and we'll read it together as we wait for each other. Amen. In a relate na topic, I promise. Aya, verse 5, tafadhali. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. That is the word of God. Amen. Finally, John chapter 13 from verse 3 to 14. This one will not put it up. This is your assignment for the week. Go and read it. Now derive points out of it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want us to look at what is service. The first story that we've just read, Jesus is walking with his disciples. He's walking to Jerusalem. And he takes some time to explain to them what is about to happen in his life. He takes some time to tell them how he's about to be betrayed, how he's about to be hurt, how he's about to be crucified, and how he's about to be put to great shame in front of many people. And what would be the reaction of good disciples? Wow. Jesus, you know, they take some time to ask him, how are you feeling about this? You know, what is the state of your heart? If it was Mrs. Morioki, who is a psychologist, how are you feeling about this? How, how is this making you feel in your heart? Can you put out those feelings? But what do the disciples do? They take some time, terrible timing, and start asking him, so, okay, great, tutadai, poor, you need to report, sana. However, when we get to heaven, <laughs> can I be on your right hand, and can this other guy be on your left hand? These guys are completely in another dimension. God is trying to tell them, through Jesus, what is about to happen to him. But these guys are just busy wondering who will take the place of honor when we get to heaven, who will sit the right, who will sit to the left. And Jesus takes some time to explain servanthood. Look at your neighbor, tell them servanthood. He takes some time to explain to them that in the kingdom of God for you to be great, you have to be a servant. Look at your neighbor, deep in the eye, tell them for you to be great in the kingdom of God you must be a servant. So what is service? Who are we serving and why should we serve? Now service, simply put, is an act of helping or doing something for someone. Now the person that you're helping, the person that you're doing something for, either they need it or you're just serving them. Probably they don't need it. What do I mean? In the house, when Moshigadi asks me to get him a, a glass of water, he has two legs and two hands. He can get that glass, isn't you? So he's able to get it. But when I stand and serve him, I am doing something for him that he's able to do, right? That's a way of serving. However, there are people that you're serving that probably are not able to do that thing that you're doing for them. True or true? Now, service as a believer primarily looks like us taking God, putting him at the center, and serving him. So primarily for a believer, service is first unto God. Then second unto people. Look at your neighbor, tell them, service as a believer is first unto God and second to one another. So why do we serve? Simply put, every believer should serve because God first loved us. We serve because we love God. We love God because he first loved us. The Bible says in the book of Romans that while we were still sinners, what did he do? He died for us to prove his love towards us because love is a verb. I say this in the first service. Love is a verb. It's a doing word. It is not enough for somebody to tell you they love you. They have to show that they love you. And God being our father, he proved his love by giving himself in the person of Jesus Christ to die for us, right? True or true? To die for us and he did not leave it there. He did not leave it there. The miracle of the cross is that God sent himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you remember the triune God? Do you remember the triune God? 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, meaning that Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And so primarily what God did, he sent himself as God in the person of Jesus Christ to die for us so that we can be saved. And it was not enough. When Jesus left, he sent us himself in the person of the Holy Spirit to live in us and give us comfort while we're on earth and still it was not enough. He went to heaven as God to make a place for you and I that at the end of this journey we have a home beyond what and where we live. So God served us by loving us and sending himself in the person of the of Jesus Christ and sending himself as our help in the person of Jesus Christ. So simply put, why do we serve? We serve because we love God. We serve because we love him who first loved us. It is an opportunity for us to love God in a simple manner. It cannot even compare to the magnitude of love that he had and continues to have for us. So service as a believer first is unto God. And then second, unto people. Why? Because the person that is seated next to you is an image bearer. The person that is seated next to you is made in the likeness and the image of God. They are a representation of God himself. The Bible says in the beginning that God after making all creation, this is what he says. He says, now therefore let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. That whoever is seated next to you is not just any other person. They are an image bearer. They carry the image and likeness of God. And so when you serve your neighbor, you're serving God. No wonder Jesus would tell the disciples that if you're not able to love this neighbor that you can see, be able to love a God that you cannot see. And I would say the exact same thing about service. If you cannot serve the person that you can see, how then can you serve the God that you cannot see? And so the place and the mandate of a believer is to serve God as you love him with all your heart and to serve your neighbor because they are an image bearer. They carry the image of the master of the universe. I want you to look at your neighbor with some fresh set of eyes and tell them, you are an image bearer. You carry the image and likeness of God. So ultimately, the reason we serve, the reason we go, us, go out of our way, to give service to the people that we see. It's to God first and then to people because of God. So it is by God, for God, and to God. Look at your neighbor, tell them, by God, for God, and to God. It is through the strength of God that we get to serve. It is for his name and for his glory. It is an offering up unto God. So the mandate of every believer while on earth is to serve. Look at your neighbor, tell them to serve. And so we want to look at some of the barriers that prevent us from serving genuinely. What are some of the things that prevent us from serving God and serving our neighbors genuinely? We're also going to look at the attitude that marks a servant. And then finally, the cross of service. Listen to what Paul is telling the church in Philippi. We're going to run back to Philippians chapter 2. From verse 1 to 8. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, 
any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own, own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Number one, one of the barriers that will hinder us from serving God genuinely is selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. Paul is warning the church in Philippi to do nothing from selfish ambition. When we serve so that we can build our own empires. When we serve others so that we can be seen. So that people can say, oh, oh, hey, oh, your mama, Anna Penda, God, you jitolea. If that's the reason for your service, then you have received your reward. And that is not the point. Jesus, while talking about prayer and fasting, while talking to the Pharisees, what does he say when he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount? He's giving them a description in Matthew and it's so beautiful. He's telling them that when it is time for you to pray and fast, he says, oil your lips. Wacha kukaa kama mtu ambaye amekauka, ndi ukitembea kwa matatu watu wanasema, man of God, why are your lips so chapped? Are you in the time of prayer and fasting? Jesus says that if that is the reason you're doing it, you have received your reward there, there and then. While comparing it to prayer and fasting, what does he say? He says, lock yourself in the room. Do not be like those hypocrites who pray on the corner of the streets so that people can see them and say, wow, you're doing well, you're doing well, you're doing well. But he says, lock yourself in the closet and pray to God who sees in the secret and he who sees in the secret will do what? Will reward you openly. If I were to make a contrast between service and what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about prayer and fasting, selfish ambition that is a big hindrance in our service is when I say I want to serve to be seen. That's not why we serve. We do not serve to get accolades. We do not serve so that people see us. We do not serve so that people can clap for us. We do not serve out of building our own empires. We serve because we love the Lord and we love the Lord because he first loved us and now we have an opportunity to prove our love to him by serving him. Number two, Paul continues to say, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. We're going to expose it from this verse, verse three. We've talked about selfish ambition. Number two, conceit or pride. Pride. Pride is a barrier when it comes to us Serving genuinely. Pride. Look at your neighbor. Tell them pride. pride. Or conceit. Is a barrier. To true service. Listen to what James and John are doing. Jesus is about to die. He's about to suffer. And these guys are just thinking. So we just want to be honored. Can we sit one to your right. Mind you. The Lord Jesus is walking with 12 disciples. So the other 10 can hear these guys. They can hear when you want to jitetea. Wakuea hapo moja mekiti kwa right na mwingine kwa left. And we can look at this scripture and think, hey, James and John's were just some crazy people. But how many times as servants of God, and when I say servant, I'm not saying these people, because you are a servant of God, wherever you are. How many times... As people of God, do we serve from a place of pride? That if I don't do it, who will do it? I'm the best in the game. We're not here to build our own empires. 
We're here to build his kingdom. It is his kingdom come, not my kingdom come. It is his will above mine. When we serve out of pride, when we serve out of looking down on others, that is point number three, looking at other people and thinking they're not significant, they're not as awesome, they're not as good. Paul is saying, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourself. True service that is genuine will come from a place of looking at the other person and consider, considering them more significant than yourself. Romans 12.3 talks about how we ought to perceive ourselves. Paul, again, now talking to a different church in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, talks about how they ought to look at themselves soberly. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I want you to look at your neighbor, tell them, think of yourself Soberly. Because what happens when you truly consider who you are in the eyes of God? It changes the way you serve. It changes the way you serve people. It changes the way you talk to people. It changes your kindness towards people. Because you remember that were it not for God, in front of him, you on your best day. The Bible says that my service, my righteousness before him is as what? Filthy rags. That you on the day where you woke up at 3 a.m. and prayed, you looked at your husband, praise God, women in the house. You looked at your husband and you decided, I will give him peace. You served him. That day where all your children, you told them, wonderful children, you're blessed. Go to school in the name of Jesus. That day when you entered the matatu, you told people, it is well, it is well. That day when you got to the office and you didn't start Adome, you just told people, you sat in time, did your best work at five, ukamaliza, going, ukaenda ukimba hymns, you know, that kind of a day. Do you guys have days like that? I'm all your days are chaotic. Receive a good day in Jesus' name. That kind of day. Yenye five, ukasema, in fact, today is a Wednesday, I'll go and just worship with brethren, ukakuja midweek service, uka worship with brethren. That day, Yenye ukafika nyumbani ukambia watoto wako na wapenda. Nyo ata huku, ukapata awajafanya kenye uliwambia wafanya na wako holiday, viombo wazijaoshwa, na kujapikwa, na nyumba iku oshwa, na huku wanza kufight. In fact, ukawapikia the, their favorite meal. Receive that grace in Jesus' name. Ukawapikia their favorite meal. And then Gioni, like a good wife, you went on your knees and you prayed for the church of Jesus Christ and you covered your family in prayer and you covered your relatives and your in-laws in prayer. Amen. Amen. The Bible is saying you on that day, that righteousness before God is filthy rags. That's what the Bible is saying. That were it not for his righteousness that covers you before him, your works, your good works, are like filthy rags before him. When you remember that, and you remember that before he found you, the kind of state that you were in, that you were heading towards destruction, heading towards doom, heading towards hell, then he came and did a 180. He turned you towards himself, saved and sanctified you. When you remember that, your service to people will be genuine. It will be genuine. You will not look down on anybody as you serve them. Because you will remember that the same grace that is working in their lives is also working in you. When you meet a drunkard person who is coming to service and you have the opportunity to be an usher, you will not turn them away. Because you remember that were it not for God that saved you, you are also headed towards the ditch. When you find a young lady who has come to church in a short, short, short scandalous cut, 
you will not chase them away because they have come to refuge. Where did you want them to go? Our service will not be service that look down on people, but it will be telling that young lady, come, 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 because the whole essence of you being a believer is like that beggar who has found bread and goes to tell other beggars, come and find where I got bread. It is one beggar telling another beggar, come and see a man. That's what is in John when the Samaritan woman meets Jesus. She becomes an evangelist without training. She goes out and says, come and see a man. When you remember, you will not look down on others. Then our service will be genuine. Look at your neighbor, tell them, your service. When you remember where God took you from, it will be genuine. Number five, one of the barriers to true, genuine service is offense. Look at your neighbor, tell them offense. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, if there's a tool that the enemy continues to use to disunite the church is offense. If there's a tool that the enemy will continue unless the Lord helps us and he's helping us to open our eyes and see it. To not only just disunite us, but make our service in genuine is offense. Some of us, we are serving so offended and you can see. You're so offended. You're so offended with that leader who didn't give you a chance, who didn't address you the right way. You're so offended with that member who has not recognized the gift of God flowing in your life. You're so offended with that pastor. Who are we serving? What did we say? Who are we serving? We are serving God. And even as we serve the people that are around us, we are serving them as unto who? God. So who are we accountable to? God. So who will come back to check I pray that the Lord will help us to deal with our offense. Look at your neighbor, tell them, deal with your offense. Because it is in the way of genuine service. Offense is in the way of genuine service. That when you get to a meeting, you're serving the Lord, you're building the church, you get to a meeting, you meet that person, already a shakwa ribia mood. So now that meeting is no longer going to be a good meeting. Everything they do, is terrible in your eyes. They don't know how to match their clothes. They don't know how to speak. And you don't know where they went to school. Until you're wondering, why do they serve? And you might not say it, but as long as it's an attitude in your heart, you miss it. Because we are serving God offended. And we are offended with his image bearers. And you will never esteem or regard highly somebody you're offended at. They will always do something wrong in your eyes. They will never get it right. Offense, offense, offense. Look at your neighbor, tell them, deal with your offense. Finally, competition. Competition is a barrier to true service. And when I mean competition, what do I mean? Let me tell you, Grace and, and Edu are laughing. And let me tell you why they're laughing when I say competition. I am one of the most, okay. Pia si wao tu wanajua. Couples, young couples when you tulinda kucheza games. I am one of the most competitive people when it comes to games. Games. Time ya mchezo ni time ya mchezo. Apo, na lazma ni shi. Na lazma ni shinde. Excuse me. And if I know, I know. I'm not talking about that competition here, games. I'm talking about the competition that is in the heart where you're, you see somebody that you don't like serving and you think, I have to outdo them. I'm a join present worship. Na mean to join ushering. To compare. To one, nani anayeza toa mwingine. 
You know, I'm saying it, we are laughing as if this is not an attitude that we have in our hearts. But it is. And if we serve God out of such a heart of competition, we will miss it. I said it in the first of it. Allow me to repeat it again right now. There's a story that Jesus gives in the book of Matthew when he's talking to the disciples and he's telling them that many in those days, right, will come to him and what will they say? Lord, we cast out demons in your name. Lord, we healed the sick in your name. Lord, we did this and did this and did that. What they're trying to say is we served in your name, we woke up early as ushers to be there to receive the people of God. As protocol, we ensured the people of God were served. As security, we looked at their cars. As the ministry team, we prayed for people. As the intercessory, we interceded on behalf of the people of God. What is the reply that God gives in that story? He says, get away from me, you workers of iniquity. Why? Because their heart weren't right. If you serve, if I serve, and my heart is not right, if I serve and all I am thinking is, is to get ahead of the person that I don't like or the person that we are in this competition with, the Lord says, in the end, workers of iniquity. Because what? Their heart wasn't right. There's something my sister likes to ask after that. But then, did you know I got a sister? Hey, imagine I got a sister, what a God. There's something my sister likes to say, Saru. She likes to say, and then. Because you see, it's one thing to be chased out of the presence of somebody. It's another thing to be chased by the enemy because you have God to run to. Now, when if it's God himself saying, get away from me, you work out of iniquity. And then, when they happy after that? I pray that our service before God will be genuine. This thing is bigger than us. It is about God. We are a small speck in the grand scheme of things. We are a tiny speck in the grand scheme of what God is doing. If we can get over ourselves and we get our heart right, do you know what God will say about us? Well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done, good and faithful leader. Not well done, good and faithful ministry member. Not well done, good and faithful whatever. Well done, good and faithful servant. No wonder the Bible would say that it is required of a servant that he must be found faithful. And faithfulness of heart will begin, faithfulness of service will begin with our heart. I want you to look at your neighbor, ask them, where is your heart? And don't forget the foundation. Every time you're serving and you keep feeling, okay, in this season I'm offended, it is okay to take time off and ask the Lord, deal with my heart. I'm starting to get offended. Deal with my heart. I'm starting to get competitive so that you can remind yourself, so why do I do the things that I do? Why do I serve? So that you can remind yourself, it is unto God. No wonder yet again I repeat in Colossians, Paul would say to the church in Colossae that whatever you do, do it as unto God. You offer up your service as a living sacrifice in the presence of God. It is okay to say, I need a minute. I need some time off to get my heart right. Because what will it benefit a servant to serve their heart out and miss God? Because it is possible for us to serve and miss God. It is possible for us to wake up and do these things as we build the kingdom of God and miss him. It is possible. It is possible to be used of God and used by God, yet he does not stay in me and work in me. That he uses you to do his work, yet he does not work on you. May that not be said of you in Jesus' name. May you set your heart right before God. So what is this attitude that marks a servant? What is this positive attitude that we ought to embrace in our service? Number one, courage. Godly courage. In the first service, we gave an opportunity to a young man. I think that we all know Stephen, Pastor Stephen, who has been away for missions. He's been away to Malawi and Tanzania sharing the gospel. 
And I used him as an example, and allow me to say this. We are all called to serve. serve is not, serving is not for some people. Serving is not for some? We are all called to serve. Called to serve the master. And I said this using him as an example. Serving takes courage. It takes courage to approach somebody you don't know in the streets and ask them, do you know the Lord Jesus? Can I introduce you to the Lord Jesus? It takes courage. Because what if they tell you I don't have the time and I'm not willing to listen to what you're saying? It takes courage. It takes courage to come here and have these wonderful people lay their hands on you. Why? Because some of the things that you come to tell them, atawao, wanataka kukwambia same, niombe. True or true? It takes courage for them to believe God on your behalf. Sometimes what they are waiting on God for themselves. It takes courage to intercede on behalf of people. It takes godly boldness and godly courage to go forth and fulfill the great commission, which we are all called to serve. In Matthew, again, the last chapter should be 28, if I'm not wrong. The Bible says that Jesus addressing the disciples right before he ascends to heaven. You remember the, the last words of a dying man are very important? True or true? Now, the last words of Jesus before he ascends are, Go ye and make disciples of every nation. And then when you get them, what do you do? You baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It takes courage to go ye. So courage is one of the markers of a servant. Number two, love. Genuine love. Service should stem out of love. A love for God and a love for his people. A genuine love for God and a genuine love for his people. Romans 12, 9 talks about how our love should not be hypocritical. It should be genuine. That when you say you love your neighbor, you mean it. You don't talk behind their back. And Anika, their mistakes, when they are not there, that's not genuine love. People of God, is it? Number three, it takes humility. One of the positive attitude markers of a servant is humility. Humility. Listen to what Paul says from verse 5 to 8, Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Look at your neighbor and tell them if Jesus could be humble to serve you too, you can and you should. It is expected of you to do it. We have the best picture of humility. Our Lord and Savior himself, Jesus Christ who served out of humility. It was a downgrade for Jesus, who is God, to come in the form of man. That's what the Bible is saying. He's saying, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Let's take it from verse 7. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Which form? Being born in the likeness of men. For a God who is immortal, for a God who was there in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. When John is starting to explain chapter 1, he's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about how Jesus Christ is God, how he was the word, that he was in the beginning during creation. That you have actually been made by him. When, when we see again in Genesis chapter uh, 1, 
chapter 1, chapter 1, chapter 1, chapter 2, sorry, chapter 2. When we see in Genesis chapter 2, when God says, let us make, who is he referring to? Theological question, who is God referring to when he says, let us? You remember the triune God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They were there from the beginning. So it means if he's saying let us with the presence of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that Jesus himself was there at creation. So for him who was there at creation, for him that is God, for him to take the form of flesh and blood, this flesh that feels pain, this flesh that experiences death, this flesh that experiences tears, for him to take this form, this likeness, it was a downgrade. It needed him to be humble. And that's what Paul is trying to say. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. One of the key markers of a servant is humility. Another key point followed quickly after humility is obedience, obedience, simple obedience. I have been talking to the category of people who are serving and doing it not from a good place. Now, there's another category of people who do not even serve. Completely. You just, you don't serve in the church. You don't serve the body of Christ. You don't serve at home. You don't serve your family. You don't serve in your office. You, you just don't serve. You, you just live a life of not serving. Amen. <laughs> Imagine. 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 Service requires simple obedience. Simple obedience. And it is required of all of us to serve him. And don't forget the foundation. Why do we serve? Because we love him. Why do we love him? Because he loved us and gave himself for us as a ransom. That is the foundation. Every time you're serving and you feel your heart is not right, that is the foundation. I serve him because I love him. I love him because he first loved me. And now I get an opportunity to prove that love by serving him back. Finally, an attitude of a servant is that of zeal and fervence. Your zealous displaying passionate, you're just passionate about what you do. Look at your neighbor, Mambia, be passionate about your serving. <laughs> Romans 12, 11, please put it up. Romans 12, 11, this is what tell, Paul tells the church in Rome. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There's a version in ESV that talks about, do not be slothful. In your service. Some of us. Can I go there? We serve but we are doing it so half-heartedly. You've not made a difference in every place that you're serving. Whatever God has given you to do, be faithful with it. Be passionate about it. And passion is not extrovertedness. You know, just some of us, we look easily passionate because we're extroverted. Me, me, we're sure. You know, we just, we're just passionate. And that's great. But you can be an introvert and passionate. You don't have to say, me, I'm not like that. You know, me, oh, wana kuanga wa extra. It's fine. But the Bible is saying, do not be slothful in your passion. Be diligent in your service. Show that you like what you do. Smile at us when you're serving us. Please, to smile here. Na pia kama unaona yambatani na personality, ambia mungu wa kurivilie kwenye unafaa uende, kwenye kuna ambatana na personality. True or true? Juneza force, na hata ufurahi, we are all just wondering, hey, buwana, niambie vizuri. True or true? 
And as we serve one to another, let's also not offend the other person. Ndo ule mtu mwingine tunafanya service yake ikuwe ngumu jua kwa offended. Anakuambia gari nimesema haipakiwi hapa ni hapa. But unataka ubishi gari ni ya nani? Sasa na si wewe security, na si wewe protocol, si ufanya service yake raisi. True or true? Let them serve you with gladness. In fact, Paul, yet one more time, talking in Timothy, he's referring to leaders and pastors. He's saying, make the lives of your pastors and leaders easy. Let them have joy when they serve you. Umegua mgumu. We are not enjoying to serve you. Na ujajitolea ukuje hii protocol. Ata miu niambie ni eke gari yangu kule. Hey, look at your neighbor. Mwambie, hey. Make the life. Look at your neighbor. Tell them, make the life of the one who is serving you easy and enjoyable amenuna ju you're giving them a hard time simple or obedience unasikia vinyo wanasema asanti amekuambia please usiketi hapa please keti tu hapa na anajua more than you know na wewe hujajitolea kuingia sharing team lakini unataka ubishi hapa ndio nakaanga this is my seat hey jamani make their life easier look at your neighbor tell them make their life easy and part of the reason why you've not made their life easy is because you've never served probably so you don't know the burden of serving simple obedience point ilikuwa ya passion angalia jirani mwambie point ilikuwa ya passion be passionate about what you're doing enjoy whatever it is you're doing because you're doing it as unto who first can you imagine if jesus was just lothful as he went to the cross and his last words were this generation mbona na wakufia hata muko serious ma gen z mbona na wakufia but what was his attitude Forgive them father for they do not know what they are doing. Can we resemble our savior? Can we resemble our master by being zealous and passionate as we serve? Finally, the cross of service. What is the cross of service? Allow me to ask you hard questions. What if there is no reward? What if I never get recognized? No one ever claps. No one ever says, you did a good job. What if the area that I am serving is in the background? I'm behind a computer, behind a camera. No one will ever know what I get to do for the body of Christ. No one will ever know what I get to do for my family. My children will never appreciate as I serve them. What if my service remains anonymous? completely anonymous there will be no accolade no reward no will i serve will i continue to serve will my service be genuine what if i am persecuted as i serve people as i tell them come to jesus they tell me you're crazy Will I still continue to serve? What if as an evangelist my heart is crushed over and over again? Ule mwenye nina serve nimeubiria tumefanya discipleship nikitembea hapa tu hapa Paris yenye iko hapa na iko si ile Olympics yenye iko nearby. Ninapatana na eh discipleship 10 weeks I've been serving this person hajakamata hii kitu. Will I continue? I want you to take a moment and bow your head. And I want you to take a minute and tell the Lord to examine your heart. It is more blessed to serve than to be served. And some of us are here, we have been doing it 
out of selfish ambition. And the Lord wants to set our hearts right when it comes to this discipline. Some of us have been proud. We've been competitive in our service. We have been offended. We're serving out of offense. And I want you to take an opportunity, one minute, and tell the Lord to set your heart right. Probably you're not even serving in the first place. Tell the Lord to help you to just practice simple obedience. Tell the Lord to set your heart right. Set my heart right. I want my service to be unto you first. Set my heart right. Set my heart right. Open your mouth and dedicate your service unto God. Pour out your service as unto God. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me, and I will serve you, I will serve you, because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heart aches. Heart aches. Broken pieces. Ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. We can stand and do it one more time. Heart aches. Heart aches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch was what I longed for. You have given life to me. I want you to say, I will serve you as you mean it. I will serve you. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. And I will serve you. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me, and I was nothing, I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we... Thank you so much for your word. Your word is a double-edged sword. 
that it is able to reach marrow bone, that as it cuts me, it also cuts these wonderful people. I pray that, Father, you would help us to serve you from a genuine place. I pray that, Lord, you would check our hearts, my Father, examine our hearts, and blot out any ingenuity in the name of Jesus. Would you help our service, my Father, to be as unto you first. Help us to be genuine in our service. We get to serve you, my Master. We get to serve you, O oh God. Help us to serve you well. Help us to serve your people, the people that bear your image and likeness. Help us to serve them well. My Lord, there are some of us in this place who are offended and it, it, it is interfering with our service. Help us, my master. There are some who are competitive in their service. Help us, oh God. There are some, my father, who have selfish ambition and selfish interest. Check our hearts. Check our hearts, oh God. Examine our hearts and blot out every ingenuity in the name of Jesus. We desire, my Father, that on that last day when you come for us, you will tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. We want to serve you better. We want to serve people better. Help us. Help us. Help us. Help us, Jesus. Help us, O oh God. May this word, my Father, bear fruit in our lives. That our lives will never, ever be the same. Lord, every time we feel we're getting in genuine, we'll be quick to come to you. That you would remind us why we do it. It is for your kingdom. We build your kingdom, not our personal empires. So receive our praise, receive our honor, receive our adoration. For this we have prayed and asked in Jesus' name. Amen.